Are you ready to stop climate change? The University of Leeds published a new study that tells you exactly how to end climate change in just four easy steps. Step 1. Limit yourself to 16 gallons of gas a year. Step 2. Commit to living in a doghouse. Step 3. Stop using electricity. And Step 4. Board an airplane only once every three years. So no return trips. But it's just that easy. Stay tuned to learn more. You might remember that time that a bunch of memes went around claiming some expert somewhere said Americans had to eliminate meat from 90% of their diets in order to stop catastrophic climate change. And the left said, nah, no way, that's all made up and you're lying. That one did end up being a bit of a flop, but this new study led by the University of Leeds and published in Global Environmental Change is legit and also legitimate levels of crazy pants. The study's premise is that Americans need to drastically reduce their energy consumption in the forms of gas, electricity, and how much space they take up. The researchers themselves acknowledge that lower energy use is linked to lower economic outcomes and low economic growth, but still, their mission was to determine how to meet basic human needs with the least amount of energy possible in order to stop what they call catastrophic climate change. The end result is some pretty wacky suggestions as well as, surprise, the need to completely overhaul the economic system of the entire world in order to make any of it work. Which to me is a sign that, yeah, that's not actually going to work. But before we get into all of the nasty, dirty details, here is a quick word about one of the partners of this channel. The USCCA is about something bigger than the right to bear arms. It's a resource to help you be ready for the before, during, and after of a self-defense incident. If you're not one of the 500,000 plus responsibly armed Americans who are proud USCCA members like myself, then now is the time to explore membership. Use my link on the screen or down in the description to learn about life-saving education, industry-leading training, and self-defense liability insurance. Now you might be thinking there is no way that any study legitimately makes any of these suggestions. Well, my friends, you're wrong. In socioeconomic conditions for satisfying human needs at low energy use, lead researcher Yefim Vogel and his colleagues say that ultimately the only thing that can stop our current trajectory of certain death climate change is to cut energy usage by over 90%. Their recommendations to achieve this drastic drop in energy usage are to put limits on housing, transportation, food consumption, technology use, and limit how often families can buy or wash their clothes. Spoiler alert, sanitation is not one of the priorities here. First, the big thing on their list. All transportation should become public, and even then, Americans should limit their usage of public transportation to between 3,000 and 10,000 miles per person every year. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, that's less than the current average driver and more on par with the average 16-year-old. Actually, the lower range is less than even your average 80-year-old woman. So, like, the goal is to drive, or even get on a bus, less than a kid who barely just got their license, and less than someone who's probably on the brink of losing their license. Seems reasonable. Public transportation or not, each person would only be allowed to use 16 to 40 gallons of gas a year under this study's recommendations, which adds up to approximately 400 to 1,000 miles using today's average fuel economy. Looks like you'll be spending that gas on driving to the nearest bus station. This would include one short to medium airplane trip every three years. 
it's not clear whether or not they're allowing round trip or just one way, but I feel like round trip probably goes over the gas allowance. It's Ebenezer Scrooge! In the housing department, the researchers state that the only way to achieve their goal is to require limits on the square footage per person. For their example, a family of four would be allowed to live in housing no larger than 640 square feet. So, not quite a doghouse, but that would be a whopping 160 square feet per person. I've seen studio apartments in Boston twice that size. And apparently the researchers didn't see any of the recent studies that dense apartment housing creates urban heat islands that are both racist and a danger to public health. That's just semantics, bro. Also, can we talk about the fact that this plan would require governments to actually hire people to enforce this? And what happens to pre-existing houses that <gasps> have more than three rooms? I mean, we can't just fuel up the bulldozers to knock them down because that would cut into our gas mileage. The mileage is 79,345, gauge is on reserve, riding on fumes here. The researchers also cite previous studies on sustainability and argue that human needs can be met when each person only has access to the equivalent of 7,500 kilowatt hours of electricity per capita. Now, I don't expect anyone to know what that means, but Americans already use more than 10 times that much, and 7,500 is about the average energy usage of a person in Bolivia. Now, I don't know much about Bolivia, but Wiki tells me that it's a second world country that ironically relies heavily on exporting petroleum and is the second poorest country in South America. According to the Energypedia, Bolivia has one of the lowest rural electrification rates in Latin America, with roughly 30% of households still having to burn literal shit for light and heat. Clearly, it serves as the perfect role model for what the rest of the world should be doing. While we're on the topic of second world countries, 10% of the world's population is currently undernourished, even with a daily global average food supply of 3,000 calories per person. These scientists say that food consumption should be limited to 2,100 calories a person per day across the world, meaning those 10% of people already struggling would be shit out of luck and a Big Mac combo meal would take up half of your daily calorie allowance. But hey, at least their requirements would help end obesity. Which, if you ask me, is the ironical silver lining. Unfortunately, if folks were to find themselves losing weight under these new calorie restrictions, they'd have to pick and choose very, very carefully when they revamp their wardrobes, as every individual would also be given a new clothing allowance of nine pounds per year. This is slightly more than a single load of laundry. And despite the fact that cleanliness is one of the most important advances in medicine, it's apparently no longer a point of interest because these researchers also advocate that single load of laundry be washed only 20 times per year. I was curious what exactly this would entail, so I found a website that breaks down the items in a 10 pound load of laundry together seven pairs each of socks and underwear, seven shirts, a towel, a sheet, and two pairs of pants make up 10 pounds. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that you will be expected to wear your socks and underwear 2.5 times before washing them. And babies, my God, it'll just be better to let them run naked through the streets because there is no way you could get away with laundry only once every two and a half weeks. 
Hearing all of these wackadoodle guidelines might make someone wonder how the researchers even arrived at these conclusions. First, Vogel and friends state that all of these restrictions are necessary in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The 1.5 limit comes from the 2015 Paris Agreement, which states that participating countries agree to keep global temperature increases below 2 degrees Celsius and only 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels a time frame typically defined as between the years 1850 to 1900. However, there is some debate about whether or not the years 1720 to 1800 would serve as a better goal as it was before fossil fuels and production were really a thing. And incidentally, before we have any data, really, on average temperatures and climate, which makes it a lot more convenient when you're telling people they need to live out the real-life version of the Oregon Trail. They reached their own specific numbers by drawing on earlier research that randomly decided that the average person should be limited to a certain amount of gasoline or electricity per year, and then looked to see if any country in the world had met their definition of decent living standards using only that amount of energy. They found zero. These new researchers even admit that in a press release for the study. They admit that all countries that currently meet any of their guidelines, quote, suffer from precarious living standards, where at least half the population is deprived of fundamental needs. Their goal overall is to somehow cut global energy use in half. The problem is the following paradox. Without such fundamental changes, we face an existential dilemma. In our current economic system, the energy savings required to avert catastrophic climate changes might undermine living standards, while the improvements in living standards required to end material poverty would need large increases in energy use, further exacerbating climate breakdown. But they were determined not to let a silly little thing like that stop them. So what's their final solution? Simple. We just need to overhaul the entire world economy, force governments to improve public services, reduce income inequality, and stop extracting resources, all while abandoning economic growth in affluent countries. <sighs> And so, first world countries would be expected to halt all progress so that the whole world can land on some sort of second or third world threshold, if we're going by the Bolivia standards. And the researchers also specify that in order to keep energy low, all of this has to be done with current technology. We're not allowed to speculate or create new technology to achieve it, or even to convert everything over to cleaner, high-energy nuclear power, for example, because that would initially require more energy. No, the expectation is that first world countries would also stop all new innovation, expansion, and growth. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a pretty hard sell. But, they stipulate, the best way for the world to do this is for the government to offer all public services for free, while raising taxes, creating a maximum wage, and also redistributing wealth. So, at least we know that the socialists and commies will be on board. Does Anyone remember back when scientists stuck to whatever their precise and specific scientific discipline was, instead of also trying to be economists and politicians and activists? Anyone? Bueller? 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 
What's ironic is that the researchers say we need to do all of these things without speculating on new technologies and new ways of doing things, but then speculate that communism will miraculously solve the climate crisis and world hunger and end poverty, despite it, well, typically doing the exact opposite. Anyway, I'm sure it'll work out. Though I do have to admit, if lowering emissions really is the true goal, they might be on the right track. After all, North Korea gives off less than a quarter of a percent of the global share of emissions, and is usually pretty dark on those nighttime electricity maps. That's it for today's video. Please give a like, comment, and share if you enjoyed it. And also, if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to help support the channel in other ways, you can check out all of the partners and support options down in the description. As always, thanks for tuning in and helping me to spread the message of liberty.